So um, welcome back. Hope people are doing well. Um, we're in week 13. Uh, so we're almost finished with the course. Um, I guess a few administrative announcements. You know, we'll, we'll sort of follow the typical practice, I think, today. Um, so the administrative announcements for this week, um, remember that reading assignment 21, um, reading assignment which concerns chapter 21 is due this Friday at 5 p.m. Um, there's a homework 12, which is now available under week 13. Um, that will be due on Monday at next, of next week at 5 p.m. Brief reminder this week, um, there is a homework 11 due this afternoon at 5 p.m. Um, when I checked my stat lab, it looks like most people had, had made an attempt at it or maybe had completed it. So maybe this reminder isn't totally necessary, but remember that's out there. Um, and written assignment eight, the last written assignment is due tomorrow at 5 p.m. Tomorrow's Tuesday. Um, a couple of people or a handful of people turned that in. So um, I think I actually already graded those. So if you turned in written assignment eight, you might have already received grading comments. Um, so that's the last written assignment that's due tomorrow. Um, there will be no written assignment due next week during week 14. The only thing due next week is homework 12. Homework 12 is the last homework assignment on my stat lab. Um, and reading assignment 21 is the last reading assignment that will be due in the class. So just a couple of couple of additional assignments this week to complete. We're sort of finished with the course. After reading assignment 21 and homework 12, then we will have a, the final exam, which will be, should be held during the final exam week. So we're sort of at the end of the line. Um, I'd like to use next week as much as possible so that people, in such a way so that people kind of can, can wrap their heads around what we've been doing over the course of the semester. Um, we'll finish the material in the course in plenty of time. So probably between today and tomorrow, we'll be able to give paired data pretty pretty reasonable treatment, particularly since it's not really genuinely new. Um, you'll, see, you'll have seen kind of an example of this, this type of technique in some previous class. Um, when we talked about one sample t-tests, what we're gonna do today and tomorrow will look a lot like that. Um, I'll probably talk about some optional material on Thursday and maybe Monday of next week, depending on how people feel about that. I'd like to use Wednesday and Thursday of next week to sort of entertain questions about the final exam, what might be on it, um, how one might prepare for it, um, and just sort of relax as we get closer to the end. Um, so I don't want anything really major to be due next week except for the last homework assignment. I think the last assignment only has six questions on it, but you might want to take a look at that. If you have some extra time this week, um, if you've already handled the written assignment, or the homework for, from that's due later today, you can feel free to do, to, to do homework 12 in advance. Um, so I guess that's about all I have to say about the administration. Um, I don't think I have any, any other notes. Um, does anyone have any questions about this so far? Is that okay? So a few general comments. Um, people I think are still conti are continuing to do the job. Um, I don't have any complaints about what people are doing. I feel like I should talk a little about written assignment seven. Um, I finished grading that, I guess, over the weekend. Um, and I graded that together with reading assignment, I guess, reading assignment 20. A um, couple, couple things about that. Reading assignment 20 went much, much better than written assignment seven. So part of that, I think, might be familiarity with the material. By the time that you're doing reading assignment 20, you probably realize um, that you are just looking at some additional manifestations of some things we've already seen. Um, but I feel like I should do written assignment seven, talk a little about it today and maybe ask some, you know, let give people a chance to ask some questions about it. Um, so that'll be part of today. And then part of today will sort of be a chance to sort of introduce the idea of paired data. So let's get started. I'll, on my own screen, I will bring up, um, let me make some adjustments. Um, I'll bring up written assignment seven, or at least the part that's relevant. Okay. So let's see, let me share the screen. So here is, here's written assignment seven. I've given myself some pages to sort of, sort of write some things down. Um, so the solutions to written assignment seven are now available under the under the written assignment content module on the left side of the on the left side of the blackboard screen on the left hand navigation. Um, 
So my, my advice is consider looking at those, particularly if I made some notes in the comments indicating that there was an issue and that you should consult the solutions. Um, there were a couple of issues on written assignment seven that I feel like I need to address. It may be that um, I think that this was the first written assignment in which inference sort of explicitly appeared. So, you know, people's responses to this written assignment may have depended very much on, on that lack of familiarity with inference. Um, but in any case, I'd like to talk about it a bit. Um, a couple of sort of general comments. Anytime you see um, in the newspaper or magazines or articles or whatnot, anytime you see anything that looks like this, um, well, I mean, you're looking at a time series of polls, I guess, that were given. Um, but you're basically looking at a point estimate for some proportion. And as you do this problem, you know, you're, you're trying to identify what, what the true proportion actually is via the estimate. Um, and so on part A of this problem, you're, you're trying to formulate some statistical hypothesis. Now, my advice on the problem is, at least right now, don't immediately jump to A it actually kind of makes sense to think about F first. Um, and so when you're thinking about the 95% confidence interval associated with the estimate, um, in some sense, you can probably read it off of this. Um, so I think if you actually clicked on the link, you would be able to find, I can't from here because it's just a copy. Um, but in this case, there's some margin of error that's reported that's associated to the point estimate. Um, so I'll write a few things down. Um, so in this problem, you know, if we're being very careful about it, we let we let p. And so of course, you should stop me if you have any questions. Um, but we let p represent the proportion of Egyptians who want military out of politics, who are comfortable with the military being in politics. Lots of ways of phrasing that maybe. At a particular moment in time, um, but I'm not gonna write that part down. So um, it, it's probably true that over time, there's some variability in a quantity like P um, depending on experience that people have with the question. Um, if you go back and look at, at the, uh, if you go back and look at the data, it seems like, you know, in December, 2011, it starts at about 63%, rises to about 71, drops to about 58. So there's some variability in the estimates that we're getting. Now these estimates that you're talking about that are configured into the series and across time, these are values for P hat rather than P. Um, remember that um, P in the year or in the moment, April of 2020, is some, un we're presuming that P is some unknown quantity that we're out to estimate. So the snapshot that we have the snapshot that we have is um, a realization number. It's a realization of the sample proportion in April of 2012. And so, um, you know, at the particular moment in time that, that we're thinking about P is, is in April of 2012. So they, in terms of time, in, in terms of the, in terms of the, the relationship across time that P had and P are supposed to have, the P had is in April of 2012. And we're thinking about the unknown true proportion across that same time frame. Um, the realization that we get is that P is 0.58. Um, there are other characteristics that, that are worth noting um, in, this, in the survey, They're not really here, um, but here's the original article. Um, and so there's some number of people in the poll, I think it's 1,074, if I remember right. So let me, let me write this down. You know, I guess I don't have to write this down right now, but I guess this is where we're kind of at. So the estimate that we get for the value of P looks like this. So we can come up with an interval estimate for P. 
Um, how, well, I mean, among other things, so from the article, I have to remember, I think this is right. The sample size is 1,074. So the realization of the count that the number of yeses, the number of people who have responded in the affirmative to the question, are you uncomfortable with the military and politics, is something on the order of about 622. So I think that's right from memory. Um, we'll see if we get something that's reasonable, but that's kind of what we're at right now. So we can use StatCrunch to come up with an estimate. And one reason why um, I think it's useful to do that at first is we're out to ask, we're out to, we are out to evaluate the claim a majority of Egyptians want military out of politics. So, uh, you know, the headlines suggest that, you know, you should have some reason to believe that. Well, certainly the point estimate P, the point estimate that we get for P, uh, P hat, is quite a bit bigger than a half, right? So in order for such a statement to be true, we would have to think that there was evidence for P being greater than 0.5. And we'll get to that in a minute. But where might that evidence come from? So um, we can go back and use StatCrunch. Let me, uh, let me open that real quick. We can use StatCrunch to come up with um, to come up with an interval estimate for P. And we need to know a little bit about the counts to do that. But in order to come up with such an interval estimate, we get a stat, proportion stat, one sample with summary. Um, the thing about what StatCrunch, what StatCrunch requires is, is information about the sample size together with the number of successes. So the problem kind of leads you through a way of doing that. So if I remember right, it's about 622 out of 1,074. Um, let's say I want to come up with a 95% confidence interval for, to estimate my value of P. If I want to do that, where does it land? Um, so in this particular, so I think this is right, but you know, you'll have to go back and check. Um, basically, we get an upper and lower limit. Um, and we get a standard error, but the thing to pay attention to here is the lower and the upper limit. And so I think it's fair to say that a plausible range of values for P are the values in the interval. Um, let me go back, forgot exactly the upper and lower limit. Let's round off to maybe a couple decimal places. Let's say the lower limit's on the order of about 0.549 and the upper limit is about 0.609. Notice that this interval lies to the right of zero. Um, so when people were answering questions related to, to this written assignment, I think they were pointing out, well, we're 95% confident that the true parameter lies in the interval. That's true, but when you're, when you're trying to integrate maybe the analysis that's going on in parts F and G, remember what you're out to do. You're trying to evaluate some belief or some statement about where the true proportion actually lies. And if you come up with an interval estimate that looks like this, and that interval estimate is to the right of zero, or to the right of 0.5, I guess I should say, then you know, you're know you apt to think that yes, in fact, um, there's some support for the headline. So are people with me so far? I mean, so that's, that's the first piece of evidence, which might make you think that there's something to the headline. When you actually try to figure out what the interval estimate looks like, you get something like we just wrote down, a plausible range of values for P stretch you know, between around 0.55 all the way up to something a little bit more than 0.6. So, you know, 0.58 is of course right in the middle, sort of saying that you've got about a three point margin of error on either side. Um, but whatever is true about the confidence interval, it definitely does not contain 0.5. In fact, a plausible range of values for P seem to lie to the right of 0.5. Does this mean that the statement in the headline is definitely true? No, um, you, you certainly could have gotten a number like 0.58 due to some sampling variability. 
Um, but when you look at the collection of numbers that you seem to be getting over time, it might even be the case in this example that 0.58 is a relatively low number. Um, so maybe something occurred, um, some historical sense, which would cause people, which would cause more people to think that the military being in politics was better. I mean, who knows? Um, but you know, it does seem like all the numbers you're getting for point estimates all lie above 0.5 as the interval of time stretches from April of 2020, 2011 to April of 2012. The particular interval that we get in the moment of time, um, you know, April of 2012 doesn't or is to the right of 0.5. So you feel like there's some support for the headline so far. Is this okay so far? I mean, that's just, you're evaluating the evidence. In this class, I feel like, you know, constructing a confidence interval and thinking a little bit about what it means, being able to take that away is something, take that away from the class is something that I kind of really want people to be able to do. Um, you know, now I think we're gonna go back and formulate the hypothesis. Oh, there was a question about 622. Yes, let me do that. Um, that's a good question. And um, let me, let me try to let me try to answer it. Um, so the sample proportion p hat. Um, let me let me write all this down. Is defined as being x over n, where x represents the number of successes, which is actually what we're at to compute in this case, and where n represents sample size. So um, the reason why we need to know that if we want to use StatCrunch to come up with the estimate is that um, it simply takes in information that way. So there's nothing particularly special about the calculation. You could work out the same interval by hand um, just using the formulas that you're familiar with from the book. It's just a convenience to do it. Um, and so what we know is that the realization for the test, the realization for p hat looks like 0.58. Um, X is the thing that we want to compute. And the sample size is 1,074. So um, the thing that we don't know is whatever 0.58 times 1,074 is. Now, if you multiply 0.58 times 1,074, what you're gonna wind up with is a fraction. Um, when people were answering this question, there tended to be two different answers, both of which I think were reasonable. One appeared much, much more often than the other though. A lot of people wrote 623 down. Um, one reason, I mean, it's true. If you round up, that's what you get. I rounded down for the example, I'm, I'm, you know, for the purpose of the example. And the reason is I'm trying to give the proposition um, that the, I'm, I'm trying to give the null hypothesis the greatest benefit of the doubt possible in this case. And the way that you would do that is you would round down to 622 rather than up to 623. You're looking at a lower proportion than one which would probably be realized by the, by the actual survey. Um, so, you know, you're, it's, it's not only the, you're, you're giving more than the benefit of the doubt to the null hypothesis, as we will see in just a second. That's why, that's why I chose to look at 622. Um, in practice, I'm not sure that it's going to make too much of a difference. Um, you know, when you're dealing with samples on the order of about 1,074, um, you know, your standard error is going to be fairly narrow, as you, as you can see. It's on the order of about 0 0.015 on either side. Um, it's not, uh, you know, that's not much of a mar it's not much of a margin, I guess. Does that answer the question? So is, is everyone with me so far? Is it okay? Right. Um, so, you know, to talk a little more about the example, um, going back to, oops, let me share the screen, sorry. Um, going back to the example that we're looking at, you know, we sort of started at the end. I mean, in essence, you know, we've just given a description of basically F and G, where we're basically coming up with a 95% confidence interval and we're thinking about the confidence interval in context. I mean, we get the answer, we can talk about being 95% confident that the true parameter lies in that range. But if you're really trying to write down the importance of knowing that fact, it's, it's important to describe what you think it means that the interval looks like this. Um, it sort of provides evidence that, you know, the headline's actually right, and at least it's consistent. If you do the work linearly, you know, going through A through G, probably is consistent with what you got before. Um, I'd like to talk a little about the setup of the problem on part A. Um, in particular, on part A, how you formulate, how you formulate the null and the alternative hypothesis in this context. 
Um, my belief about this particular problem is that, you know, all the evidence points to, you know, the evidence, the, the, the point estimate points to, you know, kind of, you know, should point in the direction that the headline's right. The interval estimate does too. If you're trying to set up a significance test and you're trying to evaluate this idea about majority, simple majority occurs, you know, when over 50% has or expresses a certain preference. So, you know, in a case like this, um, if you're going back to part A, again, let P represent the proportion of Egyptians that at that particular moment in time, that particular moment in time say that they favor the military being out of politics. Um, my belief is that, you know, if you're thinking about how you would formulate the statistical hypotheses related to the, related to this question, you're looking at a one tail test where the alternative that is, that is if you reject the null, you kind of in some sense accept, I guess, the alternative as, as the alternative thing you're rejecting, um, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna be liable to think that you have support for the headline. Um, now, a lot of people, one thing I would point out at this stage, a lot of people were thinking that we were thinking about some statement about 0.58. Well, you know, you, know, you can pick P to be 0.51, um, or, or whatever, 0.501. I mean, you could choose different values to, 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 to arrange the test with. But, you know, I think 0.5 in the context of the problem makes the most sense. Um, but I don't think 0.58 makes sense because, you know, 0.58 is, is quite, quite a bit more than half. So I think people tended to mistake, you know, 0.58 with 0.5 in signifying that there exists a majority. Now, certainly, you know, I think, and I think this is part B, Certainly, the realization of the test statistic looks like this. You know, we do get a we do get a sample proportion of 0.5a. That already is, in some sense, evidence against the null, though it's not. You know, it's only sort of qualitative evidence. Um, but when you're looking at something like this, um, you know, this is sort of how you might how you might formulate the the statistical hypothesis in question. This is where people struggle. So. So what I would do in this problem is, you know, think a little bit about what I'm trying to see here. Go go back and look at the solutions and realize where the issue was. Like I said um, in my in my comments, which which I guess prefaced prefaced this discussion, I didn't notice that there was a major problem on reading assignment 20. So it may be that familiarity familiarity with the sort of things that we're doing helped. Um, this was the first time any kind of real. Um, you know, any kind of real test of significance appeared. It's not the first time inference appeared because you constructed confidence intervals for other written assignments, but it was the first time things were set up as a significance test. So there were sort of a set of confusions. Um, you know, I'd like to talk more about this, you know, like in particular, the more about the null, um, maybe later the, the discussion I would like to have about the null might wind up confusing things a little more. So, you know, just kind of want to delay it until later. Um, but before I go on, does, does anyone have any, have any questions at this point? If you know that the count looks like 622, if you know that the size of the sample is 1,074, if you want to run the test at, at a certain level of significance, I think in this example it is 0.025, then in some sense you have what you need. Um, you, don't, you don't really have to do too much more than that. Um, you can use StatCrunch to come up with a significance test. Is this okay so far? But I do think, you know, I do think, you know, with, with, with the work that we're doing, you have to use, don't think of it as purely a lever. Remember, use your common sense when thinking about what you're looking at. You know, it's not just a question of what's in the class. Personally, if you look at a write-up like this and you, and you get a sample proportion of 0.58 and someone asks you the question, do you think that's evidence in favor of the belief that the majority of Egyptians want the military out of politics? I think the answer should be yes because the sample proportion is 0.58, right? It's more than a half. So it's a fair statement to think of that. It's a fair, it's a fair thing to say that that's evidence. Um, it's maybe not quite as strong as you would necessarily like. Maybe you wanna quantify the evidence a bit more. And that's kind of what the purpose is of constructing confidence intervals or developing significance tests. It's just a way to formula, formalize a way of thinking about evidence. That's all it's really doing. Um, under, under conditions of uncertainty, when we only have sample and not population, but we're trying to say something about population. So, you know, you, you shouldn't think that questions like this are really trying to get anything too weird. Um, you know, often things are exactly what they appear to be. And you really only need these techniques sometimes, I guess, um, when you're trying to make close calls, when you're not really sure. Um, in any case, going back to 
going back to stack crunch, um, since we've already constructed the confidence interval, um, it's the same sort of process. So I would basically just edit what we're doing here. Um, I'd construct a hypothesis test. My alternative is I want to look at P being greater than 0.5. I can specify, I can't, I don't really need to specify necessarily what, what my significance level is because this thing will generate a P value. And so what are we really, what are we really seeing here? Um, we're seeing a sample proportion on the order of about 0.579. That's the 0.58 that you see, but in rounded form. Um, we see a relatively low standard error. You can read that off right here. That's about 0 0.015. Um, the value of the Z statistic is quite large in this case. It's about point, uh, or rather 5.18. Um, so you can kind of, you know, you can, I forget exactly what parts these are, but just notice that um, the standard error P hat, you know, is about 0 0.0158. You know, so 0 0.015. So you, you can figure out about how far that away that is from 0.5. And again, that's a piece of evidence. How far away is 0.58 from the value 0.5 in units of, of the standard error? It's, it's a big number, right? In fact, the realization of the test statistic tells you that because that's exactly what the test statistic measures. The test statistic is telling you that, the, that if the null hypothesis is true, what we're, what we're sort of seeing is, is data which is about 5.18 standard errors to the right of 0.5. And when you look at the p-value, StatCrunch always tends to report these things in, in sort of funny ways. It doesn't give you the exact number. Um, you can always compute that yourself. It's saying the p-value is quite low. So, you know, it's fair to say in this case, we kind of have evidence since p-value is less then 0 0.025, we reject the null hypothesis. We, we believe, and we remember that maybe that the p-value represents the probability of obtaining data. Data is sort of a funny thing to say, I guess more precisely, uh, of obtaining a realization of the test statistic, at least as extreme as what we see, which in this case is 5.18. And so um, in this case, again, all, all these signs are sort of pointing to the same thing, you know, you. You start with a point estimate, which looks something like 0.58, and you feel like that's evidence in favor of the headline, and you're probably right. You construct a confidence interval, and you notice the confidence interval lies entirely to the right of 0.5. Again, another piece of evidence. You construct a significance test. You build the significance test, and you run it. Um, the significance test leads you to reject a null hypothesis that P is not greater than 0.5 in favor, than, in favor of the alternative, which is that P is greater than 0.5. All of these things point in the same way. So, you know, you're sort of reinforcing, you know, get, you're getting evidence, which is at least consistent as you process, as you process the data. Um, and so that's kind of the way to view it. You know, you're just trying to figure out where P is. Um, do, you, do you feel like there's evidence that P is greater than 0.5 on the basis of what you actually get out of the sample? The answer is that prob probably you do feel that way. And, um, and that's kind of, uh, it's kind of the point of the question, I guess. Um, does anyone have any questions about this right now? Um, again, the solutions are up there. You can refer to them. I felt it was important today to talk about, you know, talk about it a bit at length, um, may, maybe because, you know, we've done some of these problems in class. It's worthwhile, you know, to go back and, and think about inference a bit. Um, there were a couple of other things I noticed. These didn't happen as often, but remember, we're talking about proportions rather than means here. So, you know, when people were trying to, to use means, you know, you're, you're gonna get a result which doesn't make too much sense. Um, remember, you're talking about the proportion rather than mean. There's also inference for means. Um, we've done a few problems like that. And I think there, there are some problems um, related to chapter 18 that you did at least on my stat lab for last week. So you'd probably be good to go back and maybe look at those. Um, you know, means and proportions, a little, little different. I mean, the, the, the distributions of the test statistics look, look very similar, but you know, there's some, there's some differences. When you're dealing with means, you usually remember dealing with quantitative 
variables, things that you measure like height or income. When you're dealing with proportion, you're usually de dealing with some version of the count. How many people do you think subscribe to a particular belief? When you're dealing with proportions, you know, this gets converted into a fraction because those tend to be easier to contextualize. Um, and so that's just remember there's a distinction. And so, you know, the, the techniques don't work in exactly the same way, depending on you know, the context. So um, before we move on to the next topic, before we introduce the idea of paired data, does anyone have any questions? Okay. Well, if you change your mind later, let me know. Um, I'd like to spend some time introducing the material today. Um, let me open up a new, a new window um, set of notes. Bring them up. So um, today and, and, and for the for the rest of the for the rest of this week, we're going to consider we're going to consider again um, in some sense differences of means, group differences. Um, I guess I should say you know, sometimes. put group in quote, <laughs> um, and, you, and you'll see why I made that choice in just a second. So um, when you're thinking about the work that you've done on differences between groups, relative to, I guess I should say relative to means. So these aren't proportions we're talking about. Um, the work that you've done up to this point, you know, we've considered independent groups. So um, for example, on reading assignment 20, you were you know, talking a little bit about heights um, of, of football versus basketball players in that particular problem, in the particular problem that you were confronted with there. So in, those, in that case, you had one group and the other group, and there was, a, there was no reason to think that there was a terribly strong you know, relationship between the heights in one group versus another group. Um, they were independent in that sense. So, you know, that's what we just kind of informally mean by independence. There's a sort of a more rigorous technical definition. Um, we're not really going to check that, but that's kind of what that's kind of what we've thought about so far. For this week, we will see what happens. When independence of groups, is not what we see. Um, now, independence of groups, this was a condition um, that you needed in order to sort of conclude that the sampling distribution of the difference of sample means looked a certain way. Um, now, we're going to consider a certain violation of that assumption. Um, we're going to look at so-called prepared data. Now, paired data um, will occur naturally in certain contexts. Um, I'll write down a few examples. I'll let you consider some additional examples, but maybe it's best just to sort of talk through the examples in which this might show up. Um, I don't really want to do any kind of analysis. These are just sort of thought experiments, but just here's an example. Um, people are usually right or left-handed. And handedness matters. You suspect that handedness matters with regard to the completion of tasks using hands. Um, and so, you know, we can imagine an experiment that looks like this. Imagine you choose, you randomly select 40 people. You give them some task, give each of them a task to complete. 
using right hand and give them the same task. to complete with left hand. Now, what we're interested in here is their evidence that the task takes longer to complete with a non-dominant hand. So um, in this particular problem, we're sort of in a fix because we, we do have two samples. We have, we have a sample of information from one type of hand, sample of information from the other type of hand. So people have a dominant and a non-dominant hand. And so you have, you have all this information is kind of mixed up. Um, but what's true about those samples is that they're not independent um, because this, you know, one person is completing an experiment twice and so there's, there's a good reason to think that the observations related to the same people are related to each other. So you're, you're in a situation where there's a good reason to think that the samples are not independent. However, you're in a situation where there, it's not as though there's no, no predictable relation at all because one person is generating you know, two things. It makes sense to kind of pair these observations. So in, in situations like this, in order to try to think about questions of the sort that you see right here, we measure differences between dominant, non-dominant for each person. So we have 40 differences and we estimate the true difference using the sum. So again, what's, what's going on here is that you have one person, another person, you have one person, it's that same person is generating two pieces of information. You look at the difference between the time it takes them to complete the task with the dominant versus the non-dominant hand. You look at the differences. And so you're trying to say something about where you think those differences are. You're looking at the average difference of the differences. Um, and so in the end, what we're gonna do with paired data is really not so different than what we did with simply running a one sample t-test. That's because it is a one sample t-test, but it's a one sample t-test on differences um, when, you're, when you're dealing with data that you feel ought to be paired, like in this example. So does anyone have any questions about this so far? So a few more examples, a few more examples. So let me, oops, let me bring up um, bring up another document. So, so here's another example where we might think about using paired data. Um, you can read a little bit about this exercise. So basically you have an insurance uh, company that's known to go through, say, this, this particular garage to run repairs, Jocko's garage, let's say, um, you feel like uh, the insurance adjuster eventually feels like the estimates are too high coming out of there. So they investigate what's going on. Um, you hire some detective. The detective obtains 10 damaged cars. So there's actually a data set which accompanies this, which we'll work on in just a second. But again, I don't want to do the analysis quite yet. Um, you know, when you're, when you're trying to measure the difference between what's going on, here's, here's what you have to imagine in this problem. For each car, the detective will take the car to Jocko's garage and get an estimate to repair the damage to the car. That same detective takes that same car to another garage and gets another estimate to repair the damage. And these estimates are compared. So it's almost as though we have two samples, but those samples are not unrelated because the cars themselves are creating two entries. 
one from Jocko's garage, one from another garage. And what's being, what's not independent in this case is it's the same car generating two things. So you can't really use the technique that we think that we've thought about so far, but, but, but in a way you're, you're, you're better off than with those techniques because what you're interested in here is the difference between one versus the other estimate. So in this particular example, what you can do is you can take a look at what's happening at the one garage, at Jocko's garage, versus the other generic garage that you're looking at that's providing the second estimate. You look at the difference of estimates and you look at the average of those differences. When you take a look at the average of the differences, you're trying to make a judgment on whether or not it's believable that at Jocko's garage, you generally get higher estimates. So you're still looking at averages. Since you're looking at just the differences, you can afford to do this problem using just a one sample t-test. So it's not different than the sort of stuff that you've talked about so far. Um, my advice for most of these things is first to create a confidence interval to kind of see where the differences appear to be at and then, you know, maybe set it up as a significance test. So again, this is another example. There are many others you can imagine, but again, what you're looking at is a situation in which your samples are not independent. Um, so is this okay so far? You kind of understand what I'm getting at. Yes, Lily. Um, I'm slightly confused. So for the Jocko's garage, if you would were to do a one sample t-test, like how would you, how would you decide whether or not to do a one sample t-test or not? You know, like how do you get to that point? Yeah, and so I think for, for the type of question you're at, I mean, I think the issue is that for this question, you have two choices. At, at this point in the class, you have two choices. Um, one choice is to, is to believe that the two, so you're actually getting two samples, right? Um, I can bring up, um, I mean, it might be useful for me to bring up the data set, but you're getting two samples but the reason why it doesn't make sense to, to, to look at the difference of means using independent samples is because the samples are not independent. So in the Jocko's garage problem, the, 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 issue, the problem is formulated in a way where the same car is generating two different estimates. So those estimates depend on the car, but it's, it's appear, the car is in some sense appearing twice. So you're expecting, you know, if you have 10 cars in this example, and you take car one to Jocko's garage and you take car one to some other garage, you're not expecting the estimates from Jocko's garage and from the other garage to be unrelated. Like for that same car, there should probably be a relation. If the car is almost totaled, you're thinking that the estimate from Jocko's garage will be high, but the estimate from the other garage will also be high. So this is opposed to an example where you have two samples like the basketball height and the football height where there's no relationship between the elements of each sample. So does that make sense? Yeah. That's what you're looking for. I mean, it, you know, for the paired data, you're trying to convince yourself that it's, it's almost as though one thing is, is a, it's almost as though one thing is producing two entries, um, like in the Jocko's garage example, or like the person that you're looking at with non-dominant versus dominant. Um, it's almost like one thing wants to produce two entries. So you're producing two samples, but those two samples are definitely not independent. So it would be wrong to treat them like they were independent. Um, so in cases where, where you're dealing with, with samples that aren't independent, the only thing that could happen for us right now is that the samples are actually paired. And so if the samples are paired, then what you want to do is to look at differences between, um, between the samples you know, according to how the data is paired. So let me bring up, um, so I'll bring up the, let me try, well, I'll share the screen, but let me, let me bring up what I have in mind. So I'm gonna load some data into StackCrunch related to this problem. I think it's in, it's right here. So it's on, it's on Blackboard as well. But when I load data, here's what you actually see. So you have car one, two, three, four, five. These are just, these are just, this variable just increments with each car. And um, the estimates for repairs that you see are appearing in two columns. This column that you see right here are the estimates produced in, from, from Jocko's garage. The estimates that you see right here are, are damage estimates that, that, that would be required to fix the car from in the other garage. And <coughs> what you see here in this column is the difference between the two estimates. And so you're, you're taking the difference in a particular direction, but you're looking at Jocko's garage for the numbers that you're seeing in this column. 
you're looking at Jocko's garage minus the other garage consistently across, across the different cars. Now, the thing is, <coughs> the same car generates an estimate of 2840 and 2600. So it's pretty likely that that car is pretty messed up. Um, and so you should think that the sample that you get here and the sample that you get here are probably related. Um, they're related <coughs> by how much damage is done to the car. So you don't want to treat that sample and that sample as being independent. They're not. The numbers that are appearing are, <coughs> the numbers that appear appear because the same car is generating one estimate in the Jocko column and one estimate in the other column. You have to distinguish this type of example from the type of example that I think you did on assignment 20, where you seem to have samples which were independently generated. You just go out and you find like 45 basketball players and 40 football players, but the, the data isn't paired. Um, you know, you're thinking that heights over on one side and heights on the other side are totally unrelated. And that's kind of how we want to make that distinction. Um, so that's, that's kind of, you know, so I don't want to run the test right now. It's probably more important just to think about the type of examples that we're going to consider. And for that, I'd like to sort of do a classroom handout, uh, maybe, so I've talked for almost an hour. So I'd like to maybe have people break into groups, but I don't want them to do the analysis. I just want them to make certain decisions. So let me share the screen. Um, I'll bring up. <coughs> I'll bring up what I have in mind. Okay, let me make it a little bit bigger. Okay. So on, on Blackboard under classroom handouts for this week, there should be a document that has the title paired, uh, paired samples. Um, now I can bring that document up here. Um, what you see, I think on question two is, is sort of related to Lily's question. How do you decide stuff? Um, I don't particularly want the analysis to be done, but what I'd like the groups to do is just to consider question two in that document. Um, for A, B, and C, you have different situations. And what I'd like the groups to think about is for each of those situations, does it make sense to consider the data to be paired or does it make sense to consider the data to be independent? Does the example look more like the Jocko's garage example or does it look more like the example that you worked on in reading assignment 20? That's the judgment that you have to make. Um, so if you would take a moment to maybe find that, um, I'll break people into groups. Let's see, we should need these six groups today. Um, and all I really want, I don't, I don't care about the statistics, just decide as groups whether or not you think the data ought to be paired or not. Because when you make that decision, you're basically deciding whether or not you want to run a one sample t-test on the differences or whether or not you want to look at the difference of means like you did for re reading assignment 20. One of those two situations is the situation you will be in. So you have to decide this, which, which do you want to look at? Um, and so let's try that first. So do people see what I'm saying? It's, it's question two on that handout. The handout is called paired data. Um, so right now it's about 145. Um, I'd like people to sort of bring it up, entertain maybe some questions, entertain a discussion. I'd like to meet as a big group and sort of figure out the answers. Um, so let's say that we take until about 155. This gives time for the group to maybe open the document and think about it a bit. Um, so the rooms are now open. So if you would um, look at that handout paired samples from, the, from this week's Blackboard course module, week 13. Okay, um, welcome back. Um, like to turn to the, turn to the problems, um, maybe see what the groups thought of them. Um, so let's see where we're at. So for each of the situations below, you're just trying to see whether or not um, Really, you're just trying to see whether or not you think the data should be paired or not. Um, so starting with A, um, most people are dominant on one side of their body, either right or left. For some sports, being able to use both sides is an advantage. Um, in baseball, you have, uh, or softball, you have switch hitters who can hit from both sides. In order to determine where there's a difference in strength between dominant and non-dominant sides, a few switch hitting members of some school baseball and softball teams are asked to hit from both sides of the plate during batting practice. 
the longest hit in feet from each side was recorded for each player. Is there a difference in the distance the ball was hit? Um, so this is this is the question I think toward the end. Is there a difference in the distance that the in the distance the ball was hit by switch hitters using their dominant versus non-dominant side? Don't worry about doing the analysis. Um, but if you're looking at A for a minute, remember the, the type of thinking is what sort of data do we have? We certainly have um, two samples. Um, we have a sample of distances that balls were hit coming from dominant sides. And we have samples of distances that balls were hit coming from non-dominant sides. But should we think that the data is paired or not in this case? If you look at A for a minute, what do you think? What did the groups think? Paired or not? Lily. I'm going to take a guess and say that they're not independent um, because if you're doing it kind of back back, it's like the, the task that you were talking about earlier, um, right hand versus left hand. If you're doing them back to back, then one's going to affect the other. Yeah, and the same person is generating both, right? Like if you take a given person, they're generating two, they're generating two elements, one element in the dominant sample, one element in the non-dominant sample. So I agree. I think the data is paired. And so, you know, when you're thinking about trying to answer the question, do you think it matters? Is there a difference in the distance of, in the distance of ball is hit? What you're probably going to try to measure in this case is the difference among individual people. So what you're interested in are differences that occur naturally um, when the same person is hitting a ball from one or the other side. So if I'm a switch hitter, I hit both from the right and from the left. If I hit from the right, it goes a certain distance. If I hit from the left, it goes another distance. And I look at that, I look at that, I look at that difference. There's of course some variability. You know, you're not taking into account things like wind speed or anything else. But in this case, you feel like this data is paired. And the organization of the pairing is that you're looking at in different individuals. So for each person, you're looking at a difference. And in order to make a judgment about whether or not you think the dominant versus non-dominant side makes a difference in terms of the distances that the ball gets hit, you look at the average difference between dominant versus non-dominant across people. So I agree, I agree. Paired. Um, so moving on to the next question, I think B, um, data on ballpark attendance shows that National League teams drew, drew like they had fan attendance, I guess this is pre-COVID times, um, on average more than 60,000, on, on average more than uh, nearly 60,000 more fans per season than American League teams. So you look at a team by team comparison. Does total attendance differ between leagues? So when you're doing this analysis, do the groups think that this data is paired or not paired? What do the groups think? Angelo, yes. Um, not paired because there's no particular reason that any two teams should be compared as opposed yeah. to any other two teams. I tend to agree. Not paired. Um, you know, there's no reason to pair, say, the Houston Astros with the New York Mets. I mean, you know, there's there's no obvious way to, to pair one with the other team, right? Um, you know, I guess what I would say about B is that it's, it also is a bit of a stretch to say that they're independent. Um, you know, you feel like that total baseball attendance between leagues, you know, if you, if you group teams into national versus American league, you just do a comparison, you know, if you take a sample of national league teams chosen at random from the collection of teams in the national league, you choose another random sample from the American league. The problem is that the samples themselves may not be entirely independent. So there's a question about this. Um, Overall baseball attendance between leagues, you know, on the kind of be related, you know, be re the, the different, you know, they're, we're not living in different universes, right? So the American League and the National League, in some sense, they depend on attendance for teams in the National and the American League depend in some sense on, you know, overall the feelings people have about baseball. And so you sort of think that there's some other variable in the background which might be influencing total attendance. But you can say for sure that this, these, these, this data is not paired. It is not like the example in part A. It's not like Jocko's garage. 
there's no natural way of pairing team to team in a way that makes sense. Um, I guess finally about C, um, I've never actually done the experiment though. Yes, Walker. I was just gonna say this one probably would be paired because the same students are used for both ends of the study. Yes, I agree. So if you're looking at C, this data is paired. And so what you're interested in here is for the same person, you know, a person is gonna have different level of anxiety about anything. And so what you're looking at and see, you know, you're, you're giving or you're measuring anxiety some way about the subject of statistics, both before and after you take the course, different people will come in with different anxiety levels about the material, but you're measuring a difference. And these differences are generated by different people chosen at random. So there's a natural pairing. You give a before test and an after test, and you look at the difference in levels of anxiety that individual people have. Um, and you just sort of see how things go from there. So you look at 16 randomly chosen students from a class of 180 students. Um, you give them some test which measures their overall anxiety about such a course, such a subject, both before they take the course, after they take the course. You hope they're, you hope they're not more anxious. You hope that you hope that you don't find that they're more that they're more anxious after they've taken the course. But um, that would be, you know, I mean that would be interesting information. Um, but you know, that, that's hopefully not what you find. But the data does seem to be paired. You're looking at differences which are generated by people. So if you look at A and, and C in this collection of problems, the overall sense that people should have is you're looking at paired data. If you're looking at B, data not paired. Um, it's a bit of a stretch in my view to say that attendance between leagues is independent. Um, again, that's because you, know, you feel like there's something in the background which may be influencing both the American and National League attendance totals. Um, if you knew some information about the American League, you might be able to say some stuff about the National League. So it's not, it's not as though this baseball is being played in different universes or something. Um, so, you know, with that in mind, you know, I'd like to go back and, and take a look at this particular problem, but I'll stop for a moment, at least to take questions. Um, is this okay so far? The most important thing, I think, is, is to try to make a decision on what it is you're actually looking at. Do you think the data is paired or not? If you believe that the data is paired, you feel like you can do something related to a one sample t-test, but on the differences. So that's sort of the spirit of what you're about to see. Um, or you can do a confidence interval estimate, but on differences. So let's go back and look at the Jocko's garage problem briefly as we sort of finish up. And I wanna sort of show you what you might do. So ignoring a lot of the details, What's important in this example that we're about to see is the difference between Jocko and the other garage in the sense of cars. So here we've got cars one, two, three, and so on, all the way up to 10. In this column right here that has the header of Jocko, you have got estimates that Jocko's garage is providing to repair the car. In, under, in this column under the heading of other, you have estimates where the other garage is giving an estimate to repair the same car. So you do have two samples, but definitely they're not independent. And finally, in this variable five, in this column right here, what you're looking at is differences. How do the differences look? Um, now, there are a couple of things we can, we can do. If we're, if we're thinking about using the paired data analysis, it's actually this last column that matters. Now, StatCrunch, you can automate the difference process to StatCrunch and sort of get it to generate the histogram if you want to. And I'll show you how to do that in just a second. But it's this last column that's relevant few things about it, notice that this column is mostly positive. So you feel like if you were to look at the average value in this column, you know, it'd be positive. So, you know, we can compute a summary for the difference, certainly. And if we were to, if we were to do that and hit compute, it's, it's over on the other side of the screen somewhere that I can't quite see. Um, yeah, here it is. Um, we get a mean of about 114. So one thing about the, the, just the, the early sort of naive analysis, if you take an average of the differences that you see between Jocko and the other per car, what you get is an average dif difference of about $114. And so that already is some evidence that Jocko's um, garage is systematically more expensive. Um, how does the box plot look associated to differences? So we, we can come up with uh, we can come up with a histogram maybe even better. Um, if we look at just a histogram of the differences, we get a picture that looks like this. 
Um, it's sort of a goofy histogram in a way. It looks almost uniform. Um, you wouldn't really classify this. Oops. Um, you wouldn't really classify this as having, you know, a bell-shaped feature, bell -shaped features. At least it looks kind of unimodal the way that StatCrunch has come up with the bins. Um, but it does look like, you know, mostly the mostly the observations are on the right-hand side of zero. So again, this provides some evidence that Jocko is sort of systematically more expensive. Um, if you're looking at paired data, if it matters to you to know this, um, you might come up with a confidence interval of the differences. So here's how you might do that using X, using using StatCrunch. Go to Stat, TStat, paired, and so um, sample one comes from from Jocko. It's the way that's just the way that we're taking the differences. Sample two comes from other. Um, I don't really want a hypothesis test. I just want a confidence interval. Um, let's say for the sake of simplicity, I consider coming up with a 95% confidence interval estimate for the difference between Jocko and the other per car. If I do that, I get this image right here. Um, I get a lower limit that looks like about 32. I get an upper limit that looks about 195. So what this is saying, and of course the means right in the middle, um, standard error is actually pretty big. It's on the order of about 36. It's largely due to the fact that there's just not many observations floating around. Notice degrees of freedom is nine. That's because you have 10 pairs. So in this case, you have a lower limit of about $32, an upper limit of about 195. So you feel like this interval estimate constitutes evidence that Jocko's garage is systematically more expensive. Um, but notice we got this information by looking at differences. So we're not treating Jocko and other as independent samples, rather we are treating them as samples which are intimately related because each sample is generated by cars that you're taking to both Jocko's and the other garage. And so the data is naturally paired. And so, you know, this is the kind of, but you know, what we did here, if you actually just can, can, did, did a one sample, if, if you treated this as a, uh, as a confidence interval, just on differences, you get basically the same interval. Um, and that's because you're, you're running, you're running what amounts to a one sample. Uh, it's what I want to say is you're running a one sample T test, but that's not quite right. You're coming up with an interval, um, treating, treating the differences as the sample, if that makes sense. And you're looking at the average difference. Um, so, you know, at least right now, the most important thing maybe is not this discussion of estimates, though we'll get into that in just, you know, as time passes this week. The idea is that we're in a situation where the independence assumption about groups when you're dealing with more than one sample is violated, but it's violated in a particular way. It's violated because the samples are basically, the, the samples that you're dealing with consist of paired data. There's a natural way of pairing off elements in one sample with the other sample and looking at differences. So the statistical inference that we're gonna be doing is on differences this week, um, but they're differences that occur from sample to sample and that's what we measure. Um, so I think right now it's about 2.10. I think I'll leave it at that. We'll resume on Wednesday. Um, there's a reading assignment 21 to do. Um, it concerns something that I think you will find familiar. Um, there's a homework assignment due on Monday and that's it. Well, today as well, I guess. That's it, so I think that's enough for today. Um, I'll hang around for another minute or two if you want to ask questions. If not, then enjoy your day. Thank you.